Okay, 10 years ago, I never could have imagined that I would be passionately talking about sustainable development and the importance of protecting our environment. As a youth who is just starting my career in environmental education, it's quite inspiring and an honor to be among such amazing speakers and to be part of this event and discussion. So my name is Nomai Hatyoka, an environmental educator and engineer from Zambia, and I would like to welcome you all to the panel discussion on measuring the impact of environmental education. So as someone who is passionate about sustainable development, I believe environmental education plays a vital role in achieving sustainable development. Knowledge of climate change, perceived as part of formal and informal environmental education, helps the development of a sense of responsibility among humans through the creation of informed awareness that enables children to carry these lessons into adulthood, which then leads to the contribution towards sustainable development. So then when we talk about uh, uh, the most effective ways to assess syllabuses in climate education. Sorry. So when we we, uh, we talk about the most effective ways to assess if our syllabuses are climate education friendly, one would ask, um, how are we able to have environmental education friendly syllabuses? Are we able to provide skills and adequate information about climate change to our educator, to our learners, pupils, and children? So um, I'll start with you, Daniel. Daniel, you've worked in both the formal and informal education systems, and as someone who believes education is a vital tool for positive change, how have you ensured that the syllabuses that you've used for both systems have been climate education friendly? Um, well, first of all, thank you. I hope you can hear me, and thank you so much for having me uh, on this event. It's it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be invited, and I hope uh, that I'll be able to contribute something to the to to the discussion. Um, I think that when we look at um, the measuring or making sure that we're measuring uh, impact of um, uh, ESD education for sustainable development or environmental education within uh, within different systems. Um, uh, the, the, there's first of all, we need to make the decision that we're going to do that, uh, and we need to we need to uh, accept the fact that not everything that we feel in our gut as an intuition is always correct. Um, in, in many cases, we we are sure we're doing the right thing, but if we don't put the resources aside to actually, you know, measure and 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 be critical towards our own actions, um, then in many cases we won't be achieving at least the level of impact that we want uh, to achieve, and that's a state of mind. So I think that's that's one thing that we have um, to make sure. Um, we have to make sure that the content of what we're providing is is. Uh, um, that the, the context makes sense to, to to the people that we provide this in, uh, content to. So, in terms of the location, in terms of the culture, in terms of um, the, uh, the climate itself, and the, and the nature of the, of the uh, of of the audience of our of our intervention. Um, I think another thing is uh, age. We need to make sure that we're providing the right um, the right content to the right um, age groups. Another thing is really to check with, for example, in informal education systems, to check with the teachers. These are the people that are supposed, for example, they, they are the people that need to um, to uh, provide this um, um, this this learning process, and you need to make sure that they understand what they're doing, that it makes sense to them, that they feel confident in teaching, uh, and so on. So I think that's. That's another area that is in very, um, very important. Um, we believe very much in active learning pedago pedagogy. So it's 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 not only a learning it's not only a learning process. Knowledge is not enough, um, and you need and you need to um, you need to go into uh, checking the impact of what you're doing, not only in terms of knowledge but also in terms of behavior change and so on and that becomes much more complicated um you know the, the quantitative things are quite easy to measure how many students have we had uh, how many lesson plans but you know if if you if you want to actually go in and start measuring uh the impact of what you're doing 
Um, you have to look at the um, at the qualitative uh, data as well, and that is usually much more complicated to do. At least from my from my experience, uh, from my experience. But you need to do that; otherwise, you just know how many people you've uh, interacted with, but you don't really know if you've been impactful or not. So, I think that's another uh, area that we need to uh, look at. And so. I think th those are just a few elements that I believe are quite crucial in 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 uh, in the approach. And when I said uh, that you need to uh, that you need to be um, willing to do it, I'll I'll just give an example that when we work with funders on big projects, then you know a a decent size of that funding that we will get will be will be going to really check if what we're doing is impactful. Um, it's got a cost. It's got uh, it, it's very time consuming. It's difficult. It it challenges us sometimes with our beliefs. Um, but if you don't do it and you don't have the flexibility also to change, because when you learn that you're not doing something well, you need to be able to to be flexible enough to change and to fix things as you go along. If you don't have that, then it's going to be very difficult to be impactful. So I think that those those are my two cents. Okay, thank you so much, Daniel, for that contribution. One point I got from you is definitely on how the content that we actually provide to our learners should actually make sense to them. So the types of content that you give to the formal sector should be different from the content that we give to the informal sector. Thank you very much. So moving on to Vidya, you have raised awareness in human wildlife coexistence among the communities living around the forest in central India through various outreach programs. What has been the most effective way you've ensured that the information you are sharing with the different groups of people is climate education friendly? Thanks, I just got unmuted. Uh, thank you, V Naturalist, and thank you, Namai. Uh, you did introduce me. I mean, I think uh, Sab Sabika did introduce me, so th there was some confusion there. Um, but uh, coming back to your question, Namai, I believe you were uh, you want to know how uh, effective has it been uh, in terms of trying to create outreach and awareness amongst the kids or students that we're working with in the villages, right? So, um, yeah. so uh, let me start with a little bit of background. What we do, we work with communities that live around tiger reserves uh, in the central Indian landscape in India. Um, so the main focus that we work on, it's been more than a decade that we're working in this landscape. The focus uh, is to one, make it an inclusive conservation model. So when we are saying inclusive conservation model, how do we involve the villagers? Uh, first step would be to create awareness amongst them. So we uh, try to work with the students, but at the same time, uh, involving the adults is also as important as involving the students. So we try to work with both the uh, age groups, like uh, Daniel mentioned, age groups are important, and we need to focus on which age group we are targeting. So we have different programs for uh, younger children, school going children, uh, for college going youngsters, and of course, for the adults. Um, the fact is like, again, like Daniel mentioned, the impact of the program is something that we need to look at a horizon of about 10 to 20 years minimum, because without that, just giving numbers of saying a uh, thousand kids were addressed or thousand villagers were, uh, you know, taken into the national park to show them the park doesn't make any difference. The difference is going to happen when there is a situation. The difference is going to be seen when there is a tiger in the village or the situation will be seen when there is a fire in the forest. Do the forest uh, staff or personnel get helping hand from the villagers? Do the students grow up into being uh, you know, green uh, individuals? Um, the issues that we're facing in certain landscapes is the ignorance and the uh, revenge attitude of, of villagers makes it very difficult for the forest department to, uh, you know, manage situations. So, so the outreach and awareness that we're doing is not only about the biodiversity, but it's also about the do's and don'ts. And, uh, you know, they are the best people who would know what to do living around the forest. But at times when there are situations like these, when it arises, then it's just the human nature, just the individual nature. And uh, it's uh, something that that is, uh, uh, I would say, 
uh, reaction that human being as human beings people would give so proactively informing them saying when there is a tiger in the village what are you supposed to do if you see a forest fire what are you supposed to do or do not light fires in the forest when you walk into the forest uh, all of these things are stuff which needs to keep repeating in their minds as we keep talking to them so uh, not just taking the children into the forest to appreciate the forest because also um, you know you would probably already know that the central indian tiger reserves already have a lot of tourism that come in so while the tourists are able to go into the forest and see the forest and appreciate it the villagers who live around them don't have a chance to do that so all they know about the forest is on the fringes when they enter to collect uh, firewood or when they enter to collect uh, any of the non timber forest products that's the only way they've seen the forest or if a tiger or an animal has entered the village so those are the only ways and that's how they know the animal uh, which may not be the best context to understand these animals um, so we try to give them a different perspective of the animal of course um, audio visuals and uh, you know other methods help but um, the the main uh, impact that would be seen is mostly when there is a situation or i mean god forbid there is no situation for 10 years in a particular landscape that would be a result or that would be the impact that we would notice um we've worked in places where the villagers have had revengeful um interactions with the forest department they burned down forests and patches large patches of forest just because a tiger probably killed a human uh, who entered the forest so um, those are reactions that trigger when there is an incident uh, the these reactions are something that we are trying to mellow down i am sure it won't be zero but if we are able to mellow down the impact of these situations or these incidents that happen that will be the impact of the uh, outreach and awareness program that we are conducting with the villages thank you so much vidya and i like the fact that you are using an inclusive model in your environmental education program because we need to actually have a model that's um location based that's suitable for the people in that specific environment thank you um next we we'll move to adedoin i hope i pronounced this right as someone who has initiated environmental education programs which have empowered more than 3000 students and has resulted in the development of youth led innovative solutions what do you think is the most effective way to assess if our syllabus is a climate education friendly okay thank you very much and um, i think uh, i uh, i take it a great honor to be here and, uh, daniel uh, and the other colleagues uh on the team thank you very much for your interventions uh basically uh the first thing and i think uh daniel probably had my daughter with him because <laughs> yeah the thing is uh first of all we must decide to do climate education before we can be looking at how do we uh assess it and things like that so uh one for me is that climate education uh i mean to, to assess uh, syllabuses about how uh, climate friendly they are is about the context but before we move into issue of the context i want to say for many countries i mean currently i'm speaking from italy most of the european countries are already doing stuff about climate education quite a lot but when you go to developing developing countries where the subject is not about environment the subject is about economic development and what you find in school is uh, a, a cascade of the environment i mean the the conceptual thinking about development about life huge in the country so if the president for instance is a country that is uh, having a problem with security uh you can't talk about climate education to such now what you found i mean there's and then what you find in schools that the teaching schools are basically all how to solve this problem and all that and the courses that are available so what we do in trying to achieve this is to integrate looking at the need and uh, that's also a lot of what you said trying to look at the specific need and the areas of interest in local context and then integrate and loop education around it I mean climate education around it with that so you are still teaching the home economics you are teaching you are still teaching the physical education you are teaching which they are already interested in you if they go to school and start teaching uh, environmental education and then uh, 90 I mean minus uh, uh, less than 5 1.5 degrees centigrade students will not be interested because they don't know 
it doesn't relate to their, their, their everyday life. But when we are able to lock climate education within the context of what they are already teaching in schools, it's actually find a way into their hearts and their interests. And you find that, uh, so for me, I would say extension of syllabuses, for instance, subject like physical education, health and hygiene, it's okay. I mean, countries that don't have the subject already, you don't expect a miracle overnight to have a, a syllabus for it or a curriculum for it. But what we can do is to integrate into what is already existing. That's one. Then two, uh, uh, trying to, I mean, in Africa, most of the climate education you're gonna find are things like uh, extracurricular. We have taken advantage of extracurricular a lot. And that's why we're talking about the kind of innovation that our students are, uh, are bringing up. So for me, I would say, number one, we need to look at how, so responding to your question in short terms now, we need to look at how the subject that has been taught in school, either it's this climate uh, subject or environmental subject or normal everyday subject, how are they integrated? And we don't need to do a miracle here. It's just by extending the environmental implication of the social and economic subject we're already teaching. And that's all. So how they are able to integrate that and extend that to environmental implication and climate implications, and also taking advantage of phys I mean, physical exercises, in, particularly when you look at people, the young children, you understand, you're talking about building uh, their, their mentality from childhood. Now, those games they are playing in school, those activities just running around. Okay, we are doing the house sport. We're doing sport every Friday in our school. Can we integrate something about the environment into it? So I think when you check the subject, irrespective of whether it is climate related or the normal everyday subject, you check how they are able to integrate climate into it. I think that's it. that would be a good way to check. Thank you so much, Adepoin. Um, I agree with you, because uh, also from the Zambian perspective, our school syllabus or curriculum does not necessarily have a standalone subject on climate change. Zambia being a developing country, so the climate change context in the curricula is partially found just in a few subjects like integrated science and geography, which highly minimizes the knowledge acquired by school going children and about climate change and its impacts. So this is also, this is one of the challenges we face in uh, developing countries. We do not, like Zambia, we do not specifically have a subject in our curriculum, in our education curriculum, that's focused specifically on climate change or the environment. Okay. So we know that climate change awareness creation is key to adaptation and mitigation strategies. Aniket, um, I believe you've been working in wildlife tourism for more than 10 years, and you aid in the conservation of concerned landscapes in Central Indian forests and grasslands by merging wildlife experiences with experiential opportunities with local communities. What do you think is the most effective way to assess if the curriculums we are using are climate education friendly? Hi, uh, thank you, Nomai, and thank you, Regina Atlas, for the platform. I hope I'm audible. Yes. yes, you are. Yes. So thank you everyone for the opportunity to share some of my learnings from the landscapes that I've been working with. Uh, first and foremost, building on what Daniel Adedoyan and Vidya have been speaking about, making education subjective to the landscape that we're working with. So for example, like how Vidya said, working in a tiger reserve, you have to make the subject about the tiger, about the people, about what it is. So like how Adedoyan said, uh, you can't talk about kids from a tiger reserve being concerned about polar bears. You can't tell them to go save the polar bears or how polar cats are melting. It's not relevant to them. So you, first of all, I think climate education has to be subjective. It has to be boiled down back to their backyard, uh, build it down to the level where they can relate to it. First of all, like, you know, the crop cycle. How is the crop cycle around them being affected? The kind of crops that they used to grow and what the crops are growing now. Or how is there a change in the river around them? So you have to boil it down to the level that they can relate to it. I think that what makes the most impact. Secondly, when we talk about assessing the curriculum, so to say, uh, the first thing that unfortunately as an educator, even we do and all of us do, or even teachers do, we try and go into assessments. And the assessments are quantitative. Like the, Daniel said, it can't be only quantitative. You have to make it qualitative and qualitative is quite tricky to work with. So you can talk to 1,000 kids about the importance of, you know, saving the forest or, you know, saving the grassland or anything of that sort. But how many kids actually connect to the idea? 
and uh, I think the one sore shot way I think that I gauge how good the kids are reacting to it or the young adults are reacting to it as by the amount of questions. If I'm not getting any questions from my audience, that means I'm just lecturing. And that's not what uh, impact should be. The impact should be where the uh, students or the young adults feel the need to come up with questions, to come up with actions, to come up with goals about what they should do or what they feel like. You know, uh, and one thing I've always taken back with, uh, so this is something I learned while doing awareness sessions with kids and stuff, that you give them the ownership of their life. Even if tomorrow I'm doing a session in, let's say, Africa, and if I'm talking to kids in Africa, the first thing I'm going to say is the land belongs to you. This land is yours, not mine. So whatever happens to this land, good, bad, or ugly, you are responsible for it. If it's, for example, there are lions in your backyard, or there are tigers, or polar bears, or whatever animals, or whatever things are there in your backyard, the mountains, the forests, the rivers, they all belong to you. It's your sense of ownership that should kick in, and that's how you should protect it. So I think building a sense of ownership would be one, uh, then getting the local context right, making it relatable, the content, and third, trying to make actionable goals or you know, get the students to see questions. I think that's how would, uh, you, know, you can assess how impactful your curriculum, or whatever you're trying to teach the kids is working or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aniket. Um, I agree with you. Uh, building that sense of ownership where learners actually come up with activities that try to help this solve the environmental problems around them and will hopefully become change makers and ambassadors that share everything they learn with others is, is one way we can assess if our syllabuses are actually environmental friendly. So, um, Adequate environmental education, I believe adequate environmental education should give the learners knowledge by providing basic understanding of how the environment function and how people interact with the environment. So environmental education must help the learners to develop skills necessary to identify and investigate environmental problems and to contribute to the resolution and solving of these problems through the various skills that turn. So environmental education generally has to lead to change in attitudes and behaviors. So, um, through your experience as environmental educators, I would like to know how you've been measuring the impact created from your environmental education awareness programs. I'll start with you, Vidya. I know my, um, so uh, what we do and, and that has worked with us, like I mentioned about the landscape that we work in, uh, what we do is uh, we try to, involve of course we partner with the forest department that's the first thing because they are um you know they are the uh, soldiers out there uh, in the in the war zone i would call it uh, because it's it's always uh, a struggle every day is a struggle so um the landscape is best known of course by the villagers and then by the forest department so partnering with the forest department makes sense instead of uh, having a standalone program um working with the officials trying to understand the challenges that they faced in so many years in a new landscape that we start working in we always spend time in analyzing the situation um i wouldn't say it is to analyze whether the education program is required or not but it is to analyze what is exact message that i want to give to the audience that that is there so analyzing the situation is very important because uh, while I'm talking about Central Indian landscape, just to give you an example, we work in five different tiger reserves and each of the five tiger reserves have a different problem. Some of the problems overlap, but the solutions are absolutely different. So um, while we analyze all of this and then break it down into small bite-sized messages that need to uh, go back to the audience or to the communities at the local level, uh, it's quite important for us to also understand the solutions from them. So most of the times when there is a question or there is a problem, we try to interact with the villagers, we get solutions from them. Most of the time the villagers come up with solutions. And when they come up with solutions, it's much more accepted instead of us trying to preach a solution to them. So the method is to get solutions from them and then spread it in the landscape. 
have leadership from the local communities trying to uh, talk about the solution which is you know brought up by them and then uh, spread awareness amongst the locals through the same leadership uh, a person or a group of people who will be available there so that's a uh, uh, you know an effective way that we've figured out that works uh, to spread a message or to conduct any outreach and awareness program because uh, we are targeting a particular specific problem now this also includes climate change because we're talking about reduction in the fire forest fire we're talking about reduction in the uh, poaching of animals uh, reduction in uh, destruction of forest through tree cut cutting and felling uh, for firewood because there is uh, a lot of uh, there are many instances and there are villages uh, which depend their dependency is a lot on the firewood uh, in the close by forest so we try to find alternatives also situations where they light fires is something which is close to their livelihoods uh, so their livelihoods are dependent on the forest as well so while they're trying to work out all these um, you know methods for their own livelihoods and day to day working uh, some of them are also harmful to the forest and working around them while not um, uh, you know stopping their source of livelihood is very very important so uh, trying to maintain a balance uh, is what we work with uh the local communities who've come up with solutions are very sustainable uh they know the landscape so well they would you know give you the name of the tree which can be used as an alternative they can give us the name of the tree which can be grown fast um to create firewood uh, you know fuel uh, energy so those are solutions or those kind of solutions are very important uh these are then brought down to the school level the college level and the school level where kids are also uh, made aware of how important smaller thought processes are and these thought processes are then uh, you know embedded into their day to day lives so we try to do them through uh, you know various songs or uh, role plays and and stuff the execution is very different in different landscape but uh, this is the methodology that we try to achieve by including the uh, um, audience or the local communities in trying to find solutions and then spreading around the message with those solutions because they are more sustainable than any of us coming up with solutions most of the times uh, the landscape has a solution in hand thank you vidya so integrating um, indigenous knowledge on climate change and how we can fight climate change is very important because um, they actually have the local solutions that ha they have been using for years and integrating the mix it's actually easier for them to understand and to be able to also change in their way in their livelihoods and in the way they actually use the resources around them so um aniket i believe you're also working with local communities and i'm sure you include indigenous knowledge in your awareness how do you measure impact in your awareness program right uh so uh when you're talking about climate change education and the impact i think we are talking about how we bring about a mindset change essentially how do we measure the impact in terms of how we are managed to change the perception of someone who has received a bit of information about the environment and its uh, uh all its components and how they have changed their lifestyle or how they become more aware and what are the things they're looking to do so uh essentially we'll be looking to create perception so i think the best way to understand perception change is through art so uh, through my program especially because when i'm working with kids the best uh, medium is through art so multiple ways may be storytelling may be to uh, paintings and actual visible art or it could be through poems or any sort of art that the students can create you can usually give them a topic uh, so that's how i usually do it with my kids that you give them a topic beforehand before you start doing a session or a workshop with them and do one after so you get to measure the impact change on what they thought or what the feelings are so usually what i would uh, rather do is not go into the quantitative data more on the qualitative data so about how the perception has changed so for example if i am working with them in a grassland if i am taking them out on a one day excursion for example i would ask them to write five feelings that they had at the start of the excursion and at the end so that's how you change and you know you understand what kids felt and once you understand what the kids felt you can build on the specific learnings that you want to actually address so let's say you want to address how they felt about a certain animal or about a certain garbage dump or anything uh, environment related 
you can ask them what they feel write down five feelings or five things that they thought about it and then compare after the session what do they think and do they come up with something beyond just the feelings do they come up with goals or do they come up with suggestions do they come up with ideas that they could do and you know act upon so uh, when i'm looking at impact i usually look at quantifying and you know measuring what the impact has been and art is a wonderful medium to bring out uh, the expression especially with young children thank you very much um i like how you are bringing out the use of art and poetry especially for children i believe children learn much easier if they are actually seen and doing certain activities related to the environment so the use of art poetry singing helps them remember and actually implement what they've actually learned um daniel coming to you um how have you been measuring the impact from created from your environment education awareness programs um well that's quite complicated because we've got we work in many areas and with uh many pro in, we have five programs and um and each program has different uh, educational processes and so on that happens but um i can give a few examples I, I for example we've got a we've got a uh, program which is called eco schools so eco schools is a program that really focuses on an educational process okay? there's a method there's a um um uh, method an educational method that a school needs to uh to follow so what one of the things that we will check and we we will want to see that the that the school actually documents over the period of time when they're trying to be um before they get assessed because in the end they get a, a green flag that they can fly over their school for uh, a couple of years before they go through the spiral you know the spiral of um steps again on on maybe a different theme or or diff other actions we want we want them to to make sure that they document the different steps that they've taken uh so that's a way for us to actually uh assess if 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 the educational uh process and the impact of that process is is, is has been you know uh, is taking hold in the school um there's a lot of other ways uh, of doing it. What, you know, there's things. There's proper research that we do. You know, so we'll we'll work with questionnaires. We'll uh, we'll we'll speak. You know, um, speak with uh, teachers and students and parents and try and see if uh, you know uh, um, through through uh, scientific processes or research processes figure out uh what what's the impact that we're actually having and and if the intervention that we're doing in a, let's say a, spe a specific project is working or not another thing is uh, alumni for example you you if if you have a if you have uh kids that have been in your in your system or in your school system for um 12 years and have been uh, part of this eco schools can you get back to them uh, and this is connecting also to what Vidya said uh, at the beginning. This, this sometimes you need to measure these things in the long run. Eh? You, you you need 15, 20 years before you know if what you've done as an educator really um, took root. So um, by having these connections with alumni, we can see how uh, young what what decisions or what choices young people are making in their lives, in their careers. Have they been influenced by the processes that they've gone through our programs? So this is another way um, uh, to measure things. And uh, maybe a small anecdote, if I may, just a small story that for me was, uh, you know, so important because I... I work here in Copenhagen and I, you know, and, and every now and then I have the opportunity to actually go and visit one of the schools. Or, and that's where I charge, that's where I recharge my batteries. Eh? That's, that's where I um, experience the impact of what I'm doing at maybe at a global level at, at the local level. And that's what's so moving. And, and um, we had a, an eco school in Madagascar in a, in a, very uh you know uh deprived community in terms of economy um and and that's that's that school was um uh, 
fighting to become an eco school. They, they, they tried to persuade the Ministry of Education when we started the pilot phase in Madagascar that they need to be part of this. And, you know, we came from this European background and they said, ah, maybe you've got bigger problems than, you know, environmental aspects in your, in your school. And, and the principal said, no, exactly the opposite. This is the tool I need in order to, 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 to change things. And we said, okay. And I came to visit the school a few years later, and it was a metamorphosis. The school became something completely different. And there was a big, you know, there's big uh, celebration that I, uh, that we came to visit them. And when we finished our uh, visit to the school, um, we all went back to the cars to go back to the Ministry of, uh, of Education. And I recognized that I forgot my sunglasses in the school. So I went back into the school to pick up my sunglasses. And by, by this time, the visit was over and the school was back to its own business. Um, and it was recess and the children were outside playing football or, you know, whatever they, they were doing. And I noticed four kids that were about uh, 10 years old playing marbles in the dirt. And next to them, about seven feet away, there was a wrapper of a, of a chocolate bar. And one of them got up. They didn't see me got up, went, picked that piece of garbage up, litter, walked to the complete other side of this uh, uh, schoolyard, put it in the, put it in the uh, trash bin and went back to play marbles. I, I wasn't there, they didn't do it for me. They didn't see I was watching this, but that was for me an indication that the ethos has been embedded into the into the school and and you know and, and and so those observations are also a way that you can check if you're having impact anyway so thank you thank you daniel um so from from what i can understand from what you're saying is basically the main way you can actually tell that you've actually achieved the impact that you actually require from your education program is to behavior attitude change. That's quite impressive to actually see a child after what you've taught them, the information you've given them, they actually see the need to do, to be that change in the environment. Thank you very much. Um, uh, going to Adedoin, you've, um, it, it, it's, it's quite impressive to note that you've reached more than 6.2 million people across Africa through your eco-knowledge derivatives. Um, that's quite some impressive impact. Um, I would like to know how you have been measuring the impact from your progress. Oh, thank you. I need to clarify this. Now, eco-knowledge derivative, that part is awareness and policy advocacy. Oh, now, okay. our we categorize awareness from education. Education mm -hmm. is structured. So uh, basically, I'll speak more about the education, which will measure the impact. I mean, awareness creation, social media, newspapers, and all that. So now, uh, what we do, and I think uh, each of the speakers has spoken a bit on some of these things. One is that uh, we make our work learner-centered. Uh, but before I mention that, you know, what we are doing, learning generally, either the climate education, environmental education, there are six categories of learning. There is cognitive learning and all that. And each of them have their specific method of checking them. I mean, what works in this doesn't work in this. But I'll just speak on the program level, not to detail. Now, one, we make our program learner centered such that our students that are participating in our environmental education program, that's the one that has reached about 3,000 people and then uh, about five, uh, seven African countries. Basically, we ensure that, I mean, when we make call for application, the schools, uh, we have done some uh, learning materials that we put online and we integrate into call for application. So when they are applying, they're not applying, we want to be part of the program. No, they are, they are educated first with those materials online. And then they come together and form a team to a, having understood based on what we have put online to identify a challenge in their community, come up in, as a team with solution ideas. And then this is now the application. So even if you are not selected in the program at all, you have been impacted because you have been educated online, first of all. Now, and then when they are selected, they come up with an idea. That's why we call it learner centered, rather than the teacher centered approach that is conventional. Learners are trying everything. They just have teachers to coordinate them. So when they come up with an idea, 
Now, part of the application process, we do what we call the ex ante and ex post evaluation. So ex ante is at the beginning. What did they know? So they do a pitch. We didn't tell them we are doing evaluation. It's just part of the process. Now, they do a pitch as part of the application, but we don't do that during the call because that would be too cumbersome for them. So only those ones that are shortlisted, we have we, they do a pitch. We try to understand what they what they what they understand. Now the learning comes. We bring in an advisor who now supports them in refining their ideas and all of that. With that, I don't have time to take you through the process. We are touching different aspects of environmental education. We are touching different aspects of climate education with that practical learning. Now. When they are done, number one is that you have the innovation they have produced. And I think the most exciting one that I always share the way I go, I mean, everywhere I speak about this, is our recent project in, I mean, that our student did. We didn't give them the idea. They came up with the idea themselves. Students who found a community in Kenya where the ladies are very poor and they cannot afford sanitary pad, I mean, menstruation pad. You know? Now, I mean, some of them cannot go to work when they're during menstruation. Their husband chases them. I mean, their husband stay away from them and all that. Now, because they can, they cannot even afford sanitary pad. So our students use a uh, residue of sugar cane that normally we would throw out and all that to produce sanitary pad. Now, and they distributed over 1,000 1, women, which was very impactful. I wish I could really share the story. With them. But what I'm trying to say is this. When we see the innovation that they have come up with, after that, there are reports that they write, that uh, there are pitch that they do, and we have knowledge, knowledge sharing webinars where we listen to them speak. And now we're focused on Africa for impact, but our operation is global. So we link them up with students, in, for instance, in Italy, in the US, who they interact with, share what they have learned. And with that, we're able to trace, because what we find, again, we use questionnaire at the end. All this is quite a lot of methods that we use to come up with our reports. Now, most of those, except for the questionnaire, they don't even know we are doing evaluation, except for the questionnaire. So, because the thing is, even when you use questionnaire, there are limitations. There are things they cannot pass, even when you use qualitative approach. So sort of we use mixed method approach to get, uh, and then lastly, we have what you call personal testimonial. Each of the students, every single person that participated in our program, have something they have said they have learned practically from the program. So I think uh, these are a few uh, ways we have uh, evaluated our programs. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Adedoin. Um, that's quite impressive and innovative. Um, and uh, one thing we can note is that uh, environmental education can actually empower students to solve the climate crisis and develop skills, optimism, and resolve to lead to environmental movements of tomorrow. So children are the future, are the future climate change governors, policymakers, advocates, and environmental education educators. Sorry, I believe each one of us on this panel has received some form of training in climate change education in the past that has obviously driven our passion in environmental education careers. So how can we therefore ensure that climate education is built in a generation that opts for climate friendly jobs and careers? So Vidya and uh, Aniket, you both work with the local communities in India and usually local communities have their own unsustainable livelihoods that help them survive. So how do you ensure that the children in these areas actually go for climate friendly jobs or means of survival that are climate friendly? I'll start with you, Aniket. Hi, uh, so uh, working on, so basically I've worked in two different landscapes. One is around tiger reserves, like how we get us. And the other is grasslands, uh, which are non protected areas. The tiger reserves on one hand are the protected areas and there you have uh, jobs in the environment sector, limited only to the forest department family. And then there is a bit of about tourism. So if you categorize the jobs, one is the government sector job where you are custodians of the forest and you are the lawmakers or the policy makers about the protected areas. While uh, the tourism is more about the enjoyment, about people going on safaris and stuff like that. So most of the kids are aware about the jobs in the tourism sector. And uh, they look at it, you know, they see foreigners, they see photographers, they see people with a lot of money coming in and spending lots of safaris. And uh, they're quite attracted to that lifestyle, to be a naturalist. They wouldn't know the term the naturalist, but they would want to be uh, someone who takes people's on rise through the forest to make them experience the forest. 
But genuinely, what I think, if you have a naturalist from the local background, there's no beating him. So if you get someone from the local community trained enough and you give them that exposure to become a naturalist, the kind of stories you can talk about, the kind of changes they have seen growing up in the same landscape. So that is something uh, that would be fantastic. And that's what we try to encourage. Anybody who has a flair for storytelling, anybody who has a flair for uh, observation. So natural history is a game of observation and uh, I've been a naturalist or dabbled with the role of a naturalist. So, you know, observational skills is and storytelling. Two things is what all you need to become a natural history interpreter. So with local kids, uh, I think the rural kids specifically to speak about, it's much more easier because they live around nature. They always have nature in the back end. Maybe animals, maybe actual geographical landforms, maybe mountains, rivers, forests. So it's much more easier connecting them to uh, jobs and roles where they are dependent on the forest. So it might not be directly in terms of a forest produce, something that they can harvest from a forest, but something like a naturalist or somebody through the tourism circuit, or even for that matter, in the forest department role, somebody is a norm or a policy maker who can help protect the forests. So they are quite aware of these roles and uh, exposure to what exactly that these people do. So one of the things that I've always done during interactions between the kids and the forest official is I try and make them explain what do they exactly do on a daily basis. So what does a forest stranger do when he is appointed as a ranger? So what are his sense of roles and responsibilities? And similarly, what does a naturalist do on a daily life? So apart from going on safari, what does he do or she do in on a daily basis? So this is something uh, that I think excites kids. So growing up personally, I grew up watching BBC, Discovery, all these big fancy uh, shows and TV series about what it is like to be in the forest and you know, stuff like that. However, now with the advent of social media, you have platforms like Green Naturalist, you have so many other platforms like eBird, you have uh, so many international platforms where you can not only document what you're watching, but also share and learn and grow your knowledge. And all of these platforms promote young kids. So all you need to do is tap into a bit of the technology. And we as educators, as wilderness educators, as people working with climate change, we can provide these tools to the kids and go through a basic round of explanation on how to use these tools. But once you get the technology on your fingertips, most of them have a phone or someone or the other around them has a phone. And to make the technology accessible, makes them very prepared to, you know, understand the kind of things that they can do with uh, environment, with nature, with forest, with everything else. And I think that's what matters the most, that we gain, uh, give them that exposure and give them the right tools to tap into how they can become someone who's aware about the climate change and their environment in general. That's what I would say. Thank you very much, Aniket. Um, Vidya, would you like to contribute on what Aniket has said? I have a, yeah, I have a slightly different uh, viewpoint, Omai, and um, I feel the landscape, especially rural India, and I'm sure it's the same probably with Africa and other countries as well. Uh, the people in rural India, I don't think we need to teach them about green jobs because they 90 percent of people out there are already engaged in green jobs and i don't think they realize what non-green jobs would mean because there are no factories there um there are no uh, you know jobs there where they would be able to create much of pollution as against any of us as a single person living in the city uh, would be by using these technologies right here uh, the villages that we're working in many of them don't have lights so the carbon footprint really is so low that you can't really ask them to go lower than what they already are. They are probably the least carbon footprint uh, you know, people on earth. So um, that's where I feel as educators, we also need to understand that we don't need to teach everything. Sometimes we also need to learn from them. So we need to be open to learn from some of these um, villagers, trying to see how they live a very minimalistic life. And uh, you know, some of them don't even have, I, I mean, we were surprised that, uh, one of the communities that we work with for livelihoods, they didn't even have any aspirations. I mean, we didn't have anything to lure them with. They didn't want money. They didn't want to buy a flat or a car or anything. 
they were not interested in getting their kids to schools at all they were so happy saying we are happy because we get our local liquor in the evening the women also drink and that's all we need for the end of the day because uh, they get their forest produce they go into the forest pluck some uh, you know leaves and flowers and and mushrooms and for the for the day they have the meal right there and uh, the millet that they've grown in their fields uh, so they work in, in the fields of uh, some of these landowners they get a share of the uh, produce and that they store for the entire year that's what they use for their daily food produce and and they don't need to buy anything from the market so they don't even want to go to the market to buy anything so the clothing that they buy they probably live with it for i don't know how many years so the lowest carbon footprint is probably uh, what they have um, as against even one single day of a city life that we are leading so um, i think they are already carbon um, uh, low on carbon footprint they are into green jobs but yes uh, the younger generation it's nice to tell them what uh, you know a carbon footprint means what a green job would mean or what a climate change would mean because they are likely to uh, get educated and step out of the location where they are uh, grown in or where they are born and brought up in so that is where it's important for them to understand that there are uh, uh, you know possibilities where they could reduce the carbon footprint if they could apply some of their solutions from the uh, traditional methods then they could provide some green solutions to people where they are working with or whom they are working with so that could be an option so uh, introducing the topic is important um but creating green jobs or motivating them for green jobs i don't think especially rural uh, you know the rural uh, parts of the country we don't really need to do that as educators there are um, uh, certain things that we can take back from them uh, we are also open to learning as educators i believe so that we can share the knowledge elsewhere so when we do the similar awareness program or education program with city kids uh that's when we actually quote examples from the village life saying you know these are uh lifestyles that people are living in and um, you know so so i i feel um most of the jobs that are already existing in these rural landscapes are pretty green in nature uh no my you're on mute uh, yeah sorry Uh, coming back to you, Vidya. Um, as we're talking about the local communities, one thing I've noticed, having worked with local communities, especially in the rural parts of Zambia, is that they're they're engaged in certain practices that are unsustainable that help them survive. So there's like charcoal production; they cut down trees that leads to deforestation. They have improper or improper fishing methods or farming methods. So then, how then do we actually ensure that their children do not take up the same practices that they are actually doing i don't know if you also experience such sustain and such unsustainable livelihoods in in india where you're working right now so yes uh, no my we we do have these practices and uh, i i was just differentiating these day to day lifestyle practices from a green job um when you talk about daily uh, needs that the villagers would have from the forest or they would be dependent on the forest yes the firewood collection is one of the biggest uh, threats that we have to the forest and that is where we've uh, worked with the villagers to find solutions like for example there is a flower called mahua um which is collected from the forest or from the trees when uh, when it's ripe the flowers fall on the ground and there is local liquor that is made out of the flowers this is a big livelihood opportunity for villagers and it lasts only for about 2 weeks so those two weeks uh, during peak summers villagers actually go into the forest they light fire under the tree because they want to clear the litter and that creates a huge forest fires every summer we've got forest fires in india there are no natural forest fires in india we have all man made forest fires so those are kind of threats that we are looking at what we uh, work with or what we do is really coming up with solutions now you would see in the last 10 years actually in the last 5 years villagers have come up with solutions where forest department has also partnered in few tiger reserves the forest department has actually shared nets that can be uh, spread out under the trees so that when there is a collection time because they have to spend almost entire morning from 3 in the morning till about 9 10 o'clock in the morning till it's peak sunlight and uh, they also face the threat of having wild animals around the tree because it's very sweet flowers so you have sloth bears and other uh, wild animals around the tree as well 
So the, the a partnership between the forest department, NGOs and the communities have brought about solutions where the practices are slowly fading away, which are hampering the, uh, you know, the, uh, or destroying the forest and climate around. Um, so the solutions have come out. One is, uh, you know, the net villagers have actually, uh, you know, uh, covered the ground under the tree with cow dung. So that kind of clears up the land for those many weeks, couple of weeks or three weeks, two to three weeks. And that helps them to collect the flowers very easily. The third solution they've come up with is uh, uh, spreading out their own saris or, or uh, the, the bed sheets that they have. So those are solutions that people have come up with. They also clear with just cleaning with a broom. So mostly now the uh, in the last five years, the forest fires due to uh, Mahua season you know, uh, collection has reduced. But those are things that we are working with when we start creating outreach and awareness. That is definitely something that we've been working with them and they come up with solutions. Okay, thank you very much, Vidya and Aniket, on that insight on the local communities in India. Um, uh, getting back to you, Adedoin, um, um, as a mentor in the environmental sector, um, as we are talking about the climate friendly jobs and how we can actually entice children to actually take up these green jobs or careers. Do you think mentorship plays a vital role in ensuring that students at university opt for climate friendly jobs or careers? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before I respond to that, I was really enjoying uh, Vidya's uh, idea and perspective because, I mean, by the way, I'm also a researcher. I do scientific research and I do on rural, uh, rural communities in developing countries. Yeah, I quite agree with uh, many of those positions, but I just think that in terms of green jobs, there are still many ways that we can still help rural communities on green jobs. For instance, the sales of firewood, firewood, uh, the sales of petroleum, if we are able to uh, help them to support them with uh, improve, I mean, uh, modern energy access, definitely we can transit them from use of fuel wood and then that job is cut down. I mean, I did a thorough research on that. Uh, that's the, SDG, uh, the, the one on uh, SG8, basically. So uh, also uh, you find out that the amount of money spent on uh, fossil fuel in rural community per household could be more than those in the community, in the urban community, because there is long value chain to transport these things there. So if we are able to develop their own energy system, they will not need this anymore. And by the way, just to mention, when we talk about green jobs, it doesn't have to be environmental jobs. A major pillar within green growth framework is social equity. So I mean, social inclusion. So when we do even social activity, if we have that orientation, we skew them, just the strategies, it definitely can contribute to green jobs. But now back to, but I really enjoyed these positions. Really, that's why it aligns with me because I can feel, uh, I, I can imagine what you're talking about. I work with them. So basically, mentorship play a very critical, critical role. Uh, for instance, uh, I mean, we are many people. If you see that we have a mentoring for research program that has been in 55 universities across 22 African countries. And what we have found, I mean, up to yesterday, you know, what we have found up to yesterday, we still have reports of outcome for people that are alum, alumni that uh, they were mentored during their on their research program in university, and they are finished, they are done, and they are still doing joint work. They are still doing partnership with their mentors. These mentors are sometimes people that are up there. For instance, somebody uh, lecturing Harvard University Imperial College, lecturing our students in Ghana. You understand? So they help them to shape their perspective. In, uh, the, and we have found even in our mentoring program, even though like we, it's a rule, no mentee is to request for anything in terms of funding, in terms of opportunity from the mentor. But we have had mentors who went on out of their way to create opportunities to get grants for the student, to get jobs for them. One of them got international jobs. So I think it contributed. But just to mention two things, is that uh, in preparing young people for green jobs in the future, number one is, we have to make it skill based. There is a top bottom, bottom up approach and all that. Now, skill based is to build the students into the future. Now, why we are also working with industry partners to change the operation mechanism such that as these guys are growing up, they find a place at the top that can absorb them. Thank you. Uh, Nomai, I'd just like to interject. We have about three minutes remaining. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. 
Yeah, and, and we have a question that uh, a few questions that we wanted to ask as well, but we can go to Daniel and. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Sadika. Um, Daniel, uh, you, you need to be quick about this one. Uh, so Daniel, um, you're passionate about the environment and I believe passion plays an important role in choosing a career path. How can we ensure that environmental education helps create that passion in learners to, ex to the extent where they opt for green jobs or climate friendly careers? Um, okay, I'll try and be brief. I think the first thing is that you need to create an emotional connection and that emotional connection to the subject, to the area that you're going to be uh, investing your life in um, will come through um, action based learning. I think that that's very important. If you if you take action uh, and you build that sense of um, belonging uh, through activities that you participate in within your, your within your school um, and so on, that will create a sense of uh, ownership, a sense of need for protection of what is yours in terms of the ownership. That's very important. Um, and I think that if we if we do this correctly, then we can create that uh, commitment within young people to make these choices. I think we also need to recognize the fact that we're battling an, an uphill battle in many in many cases in terms of the economies and how the economy is perspective uh, perceived um you know in terms of consumption and so on these these are difficult things but another thing which i think is very important um not at the community level maybe like um, aniket and uh, vidya uh, spoke about but at the systematical level is is looking at um is looking at vocational education so where young people go to learn to, to you know to get a to get a trade or a, we need to work with these uh systems as well and and definitely within higher education which is always a problem because there's always freedom of a, there's academic freedom and so on we need to make sure that the people that work in architecture and engineering and and these kind of fields where people are going to get their um they you know going to get a job for the for the rest of their lives the people that teach this and it need to be committed to these technologies to the state of mind so that's another area that we need to work with a lot is higher education and vocational education as well so that, and i'll finish there Hi, uh, this is Amit here. Sorry to interject the uh, the panel. Um, before we end the session, I had a couple of questions. One from uh, one from the audience, and the other one, which is quite intriguing by myself. I mean, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, probably we have uh, missed out on uh, talking about urban environment education programs because that's where the largest carbon footprint and Vidya taking your point forward that uh, the rural part of the world is already living a sustainable lifestyle. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, whatever I can see, I mean, in my limited time of uh, involved, involving myself with uh, people like yours and, and my experience with We Naturalists, I've realized that a lot more attention in environment education is given uh, from a measurable impact thought process on, on rural uh, or underprivileged sector. Uh, while the entire carbon footprint is created by the urban uh, uh, set of, uh, you know, whether it's youth or, or people living in urban areas. So is there <clears throat> anything to take away from this particular converse conversation that sometimes we end up uh, focusing on things which uh, are important, but they are not actually making that much of delta as far as uh, the environment uh, uh, or, or reducing carbon footprint is concerned. You know, so while we work with communities, while we work with uh, relatable thought processes at the underprivileged level, whether Aniket, your point of making things relatable, obviously you'll be able to make things relatable more with uh, the interventions that. Uh, Adorin was talking about, or uh, which was on uh, 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 creating sustainable uh, uh, pads, or probably teaching people at the ground level uh, in central part of India about tiger and and its uh, 
it's uh, issues around that or probably living sustainable lifestyle is is something which is much more uh, a bigger problem in urban areas so how do we address that part or it's getting neglected in some manner <clears throat> Vidya, you want to take it? Hi, Amit. Amit, uh, so quickly, I know we're running short of time. So um, I think the urban audience is uh, one, of course, you know, the, the dent is going to be made there. Uh, like you rightly said, you know, if there is something that we could do really as a country, I think we should focus on the urban audience and, and see where we could reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, but also I would... Uh, understand that the syllabus which is there in the schools and colleges and also the access that the kids have these days to um, TVs and internet, BBCs and channels like that, that is already available. Now we need to really make them into capsule form to break it down into a day-to-day -day lifestyle change that needs to be done because there's a lot of talk about how do we globally change, how do we as a country change, but me as an individual who stays in a city like Mumbai, you know, what am I supposed to do? Am I su supposed to switch off my lights right now? Am I supposed to switch off my internet? Am I supposed to not have internet connection? What am I supposed to do? And will there be a dent? Now that is where at the school level, starting from the school level, the syllabus is there. But I guess like I think in the beginning, I think Daniel or uh, I don't know, somebody mentioned saying the teachers have to be really motivated to do that. It has to be beyond yeah. the syllabus. It can't be just by the books. So it has to be more uh, beyond the books where we could talk about solutions in every city. But that is something that we need to break down into actionable points. Right. So my question, my question actually was whether we are, uh, whether that's getting neglected in some form, because, you know, I, there is education already there. So Daniel, maybe you want to uh, just take this. Um, look, I, I think, you know, this, pa this panel discussion has um, uh, different perspectives in it. Some are more local, some are more uh, maybe continental, some are more uh, global. Um, you know, we have 60,000 schools in our network. They're not rural. Some of them are rural, but many of them are not rural. Um, so uh, I think that, again, there's, a, there's, an, there's a, the a huge importance of context that you teach people about the things that touch them and are um, the, that they can relate to and understand. Uh, I think that's very important, and it happens in in cities as well. Um, I think that uh, we need to look at uh, um, also an inter. Uh, uh, there's a there's a generation gap, which is very pro because it's not only um, video. It's not only um, rural people that are living a more sustainable life, but our grandparents in the cities lived a more sustainable life. There's no, there's no discussion at that level between the generations and no lessons learned between the generations. And I think that's a great pity. And that's something that we need to, um, to, we need to address. And I think that the last thing is that we're fighting we're fighting, okay, I'm going to get a little philosophical, and I know that this is, we're, we're short on time, but we're fighting a battle which is now um, over 70 years old uh, in terms of how we, what our, what's, what's a good economy looking like? Uh, and and when you're looking at the cities and you're looking at consumption, this is a very difficult thing to change because we have built over quite a, decades now a system which is completely channeled into one direction yeah. of of economical growth, and that and that is what we need to change. And it's a very com complex thing to do. And that's the reality. I mean, that's in essence the challenge that we have in front of us. Okay, great. I'll just be very brief. I think I'll just say two things. Uh, I agree with all the points. Uh, one, same goal, same purpose, but differentiated responsibilities. Now, uh, I mean, when you look at, let's take rural and urban, and then take developed and developing countries. We cannot say developing countries does not have things to do in terms of climate mitigation and their adaptation, uh, in terms of reducing their footprints. Whereas we understand that developed world are producing more. So what they need to do may be more. What they need to learn may be more. What they need to sacrifice may be more. 
Yet, developed countries, I mean, developing countries also have their personal reasons. And then the contexts we differ. So, for instance, we're talking about firewood. I lived, I, I traveled from Italy to go and do a research in rural communities across Nigeria, and I stayed with them for weeks. So, there are various ways that rural communities, even though they are not contributing commensurately to climate change issues, uh, they have in, in need a lot of role to play. And let's also remember that this is about all. Sustainable energy for all, climate action for all, it has to be for all. And last point, if we say that, oh, rural community, yeah, what we need to do, you know, rural community are trying to, to jump the development gap. You understand? Now, if we don't step them to understand the pathway that they should go, the pathway of the future, they yeah. also don't go the same way your bank communities are called. And then we'll be, we'll be solving the problem in the city, creating more problems in the community. So we really need to help them to, re, to define their path, why they're doing that. So I think the last point I wanted to mention is that, for instance, in developing country, you realize that, for instance, in Africa, uh, rural, people in rural community are probably about 60%, more than 50 for sure, about 60% of the whole population. So if we exempt by any way, those in rural community, then we are exempting 60% of the actors and where the actions will come. So for instance, agriculture contributes a lot to, uh, what's it called, to climate change. The issue is where do they do the family? <clears throat> communities. So I think the issue is about all, same purpose, same goal, but differentiated responsibilities. Thank you. That uh, that clearly uh, defines, and probably uh, I got my, uh, I probably I got my answer. Uh, so just one point before we end this particular panel and this uh, audience question, which I have to and I must ask, is that uh, I think there's also a, a impact that can be made by a lot of news channels, which are only talking about nature as catastrophe and not uh, showing the beautiful side of that. Right, and I, I think that's one question from uh, one of, one of the uh, uh, participants over here. So, uh, what do you think about that? And maybe we can have a one-liner on that on each from each one of you. Namai, Namai, you would want to say about that? Um, thank you very much. Um... <clears throat> One thing we've noticed about the news, uh, news and information sharing is sometimes it's misleading. Um, when we share, like for example, in, in the Zambian context, when we first heard about climate change, global warming, it was something that was scary to children. So I feel we have to give that balance to show them how the world is or was, how beautiful it was, and then show them if we do not take care of our environment, the impacts that would actually get would no longer have the beautiful trees that we actually see right now, will no longer have the beautiful rivers. So I believe we need a balance of both. Thank you. Daniel, maybe you want to take a bite on that. Um... Look, I, th I think the news is the news. It's, it's got a way of, you know, it's it's uh, it's 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 problematic in many ways. But I think that the weight, I think an important thing, and particularly going back to your question about uh, 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 urban communities, is reconnecting people to nature. I think that's a very uh, that's an important um, aspect uh, through positive experiences. Uh, yeah. You build you build a bond, and if we don't do that, and if we 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 continue looking at our only at our screens in you know in concrete in concrete cities, and we we um, don't allow young people to experience that, then they won't have the commitment or the emotional bond that we need them to have with nature. Right. How about you, Aniket? Yeah, uh, so I agree completely with what Daniel and Adidon said. And uh, it's a very important tool when we specifically talk. Like I said, I connected with uh, Nat and BBC before even coming into the field. Similarly, uh, like I was saying about even the rural and the urban context, with India, when we talk about natural spaces and uh, places that are still pristine, that need to be preserved, we often look beyond the cities. From, from the urban landscape, we move towards 
more towards the rural landscape about the areas that need active conservation measures and stuff like that. So coming back to the question that you asked before, that uh, yes, urban context gets neglected in some places because right now the nature has already been uh, you know, pushed out to the brink. Like if you talk about Mumbai or if you talk about any urban city, you've already pushed nature to quite a tipping point. So when we talk about, uh, you know, prioritizing in terms of uh, our efforts towards the rural landscape, that's where my uh, thing comes that we focus more on the rural and sometimes, yes, we tend to neglect on the urban. Although it's not a fair thing, although urban masses do have a voice and they will make probably a more uh, stronger impact when it comes to carbon footprint in terms of even uh, law and policy making decisions, stuff like that. So yes, a citizen science movement from the cities also makes a big, big, big impact. But yes, uh, I think uh, like Adidoin said, we all are working towards one common purpose. We need to get everybody on board. We need to have right. everybody <clears throat> targeting different places. And the news channels, of course, uh, with the amount that we are spending only on about the cheetah. Like for example, in India, the cheetah is a big hot topic because of the <clears throat> production. I think the amount of Footage that only the uh, the eight odd individuals of animals that got, rather than that, if you could have spoken a little bit about what the entire community that lives around Pune, the park that where the cheetahs were brought in, about what the yeah. measures were, what the stories are of that area, I think people would have connected more than <coughs> just talking about uh, flagship species. I think that would have made a big difference. Yeah. And I think moving forward, a lot more stories about the people of the landscape. Or the people of the forest will make a big difference going forward. And that's where I would like I agree. to <clears throat> Thank you, Aniket. Thank you. Uh, Namai, any last thoughts uh, before we close the panel uh, so that we can uh, just move to the next session? Okay. Um, no, I just want to say uh, thank you so much to the speakers and to everyone who joined in the discussion. Let's uh, continue contributing to climate action by creating impact in environmental education. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat>